Norfolk Southern is making changes following the derailment of two of its trains in Ohio. Over the weekend, 28 cars left the track in Springfield one month after a train derailed near the Pennsylvania border, spilling toxic chemicals in East Palestine. The rail operator released a six-point safety plan in response to those accidents, including improving what is known as hot bearing detectors on the tracks, which the National Transportation Safety Board said played a role in the East Palestine derailment. The company's plan does not include many of the changes the Biden administration has been calling for. Joining us now, live U.S. Transportation Secretary <coughs> Pete Buttigieg. Mr. Secretary, thanks for your time this morning. Um, you've seen the plan rolled out by Norfolk Southern in response to these derailments in Ohio, one as recently as a few days ago over the weekend. Uh, does it go far enough? Well, uh, certainly those steps are positive, but there has to be more, not just in terms of things that the railroads do voluntarily, but things that we require them to do. That's one of the reasons we're working with Congress on uh, everything from stiffer pen penalties for safety violations to an accelerated timeline for uh, uh, getting these tank cars upgraded. We're reviewing the letter from Norfolk Southern. Again, these are, to be clear, positive steps. Those uh, so-called hot box detectors can uh, detect uh, an issue in a wheel bearing even when the track itself is in good condition. That would have been relevant uh, and was relevant in the case of the East Palestine derailment. And even though uh, it'll be a while before NTSB has their final recommendations, uh, we know enough to, to know that uh, this needs more attention and we have a safety advisory out on that topic. Look, we continue to see incident after incident. The major incident in East Palestine the uh, derailment that took place in Clark County, uh, thankfully less severe, but still uh, obviously very frightening for those residents who were told to shelter in place while they were confirming whether there had been a hazmat release. And just this morning, uh, we are getting reports of a worker fatality uh, mm -hmm. in an incident also involving a Norfolk Southern train in Ohio. Uh, now, uh, uh, the brutal reality is that there have always been more of these kinds of incidents than I think a lot of Americans realize. It's why we've been working on rail safety from day one. But I think right now, with the level of public attention that there is on railroad safety and accountability, we can do more than was ever possible before in terms of what we expect from the railroads, in terms of what we as a department do, and again, in terms of what we have to work with Congress to make the law of the land. I think you're right, Mr. Secretary. A lot of Americans have been surprised since the East Palestine derailment and the disaster there with the chemicals just to learn about how the rail industry, freight rail industry works and that these not frequent, but they happen a lot more often than people realize. These derailments are part of the cost of doing business for these companies and also things like, oh, there only have to be two people on these long trains uh, watching and monitoring what's going on here. So. How did we get to a place where it does appear to be, in many cases, dangerous just to operate these freight trains? Well, often what happens is that there will be a set of crashes or incidents, a public uproar, a lot of regulation, and then over time the regulation gets watered down. About 10 years ago, for example, there were a series of derailments, including a horrific case in Canada where 47 people were killed uh, when a, a train carrying a lot of uh, volatile materials exploded in, in Quebec. After that, there were more regulations, more legislation, but in the years after that, when things got a little quieter, that's when the railroad lobby was able to flex some muscle, got provisions into the transportation bill in 2015 that slowed down the adoption of these fortified tank cars, uh, got provisions in there that uh, made it more difficult for my department to maintain certain rules uh, related to braking. So in, in many ways, unfortunately, the, this uh, is partly a story about the political dynamics here in Washington, but those dynamics have to change. We have to cut through the politics, get real reform done. Again, we've been working on it from day one in terms of uh, the work our department's doing, like that, that issue of two-person crews. Believe it or not, uh, the, the freight railroad industry has actually been pushing to be allowed to have just one crew member, even on mm. these trains that can be two, three, or more miles long. Uh, I think that defies common sense, and uh, we're going through that process right now, having, uh, as soon as we got here, uh, revived that, that, uh, that regulation. But so think about this. Even when a railroad... Go ahead, sorry. Well, I was going to say, so in that last point that you just raised, Mr. Secretary, the 200, 212, 224 long length of cars, how much of that has to do with economics and safety? Hmm. 
Well, a lot of this has been driven by economics. If you look at the freight railroad industry, especially since it got increasingly taken over in terms of ownership by private equity with a real focus on the bottom line, uh, what you've seen over the years is a model that really strips away the human element. Uh, many uh, of these firms, uh, more than a third or more of the workforce is gone compared to where we were uh, a decade or two ago, uh, and uh, just a relentless focus on the bottom line. But the really frustrating thing about this is even though it's made these companies more efficient in terms of profitability. It actually has not made them more efficient in terms of their job, which is to deliver uh, freight uh, to, to different places around the country. Uh, as you know, We've been working every angle of the supply chain issue uh, really since uh, the, the height of the pandemic. There was a lot of attention on shipping and ports, a lot of attention on the availability of truckers. But I'll tell you, one thing we've seen is a lot of frustration about the performance of the Class 1 freight railroads. Uh, so what we see is the performance has not reached the level that it should, and there are these concerns about safety. Uh, yes, these companies are incredibly profitable, but to me that's just evidence uh, that they can be held to a higher standard and still be successful as businesses. Mr. Secretary, good morning. Switching gears, Sorry. we heard from President a busy Biden. Now. Oh, we may have lost the Mr. Transportation Secretary's audio. Willie, we did lose the Transportation Secretary's audio just now. But certainly this speaks to uh, this effort to try to curb these crashes like this. And not just about the length of trains and railroad safety, but also trying to put new regulations on railroads that have hazardous materials. It's yeah. not just that there's a derailment. It's a derailment with toxic chemicals that could have uh, damaging effects for generations to come. And there's legislation that's working its way slowly through the Congress. The Biden administration said um, it would support that. We do have the secretary back, John. Mr. Secretary, I hope you can hear us out. There he is. I uh, wanted to shift gears and ask you about what we heard from President Biden in the State of the Union. And since then, the White House really cracking down on these so-called junk fees. And Department of Transportation has an effort to get rid of extra fees uh, that airlines have been imposing on families who are trying to sit next to each other, parents trying to keep their kids nearby. So tell us about that effort. Can you compare Tell airlines to comply, and if not, what consequences could they face? So we start with the simple proposition that when you're flying with your kids, you shouldn't have to pay extra in order to sit next to them. And what a lot of parents <laughs> experience is either they, they face that fee or there's some desperate negotiation with a gate agent or, or with other passengers on board. And look, flying with kids is uh, hard enough. Flying without kids can be hard enough sometimes. Uh, we, we shouldn't allow airlines to do anything that would make it harder. So here's what we're doing. Uh, we put up information that makes it very clear for for passengers, which airlines are meeting the standard we have proposed uh, of allowing anybody under 13 to fly with their parent, to be seated with their parent at no extra cost. Since we put out that call just a few weeks ago, three airlines have joined. Uh, they're going to be getting green check marks on our uh, airline customer service dashboard. Those airlines are uh, Alaska, American, and Frontier. We're calling on all of the airlines to do the same. Now, to be clear, we are also taking steps to require this, but one thing I've found repeatedly in this job is that the regulatory and rulemaking process, just as a legal matter, takes a very long time. And I don't have to wait on that. I don't want to wait on that process to finish to get the changes now, uh, which is why we're, our message to the airlines is uh, we've made this now transparently clear uh, to the public. We want you to guarantee in writing, in a way that our department can enforce uh, with fines for violations, that you're going to do this. And again, those three airlines have said yes. Uh, we hope all 10 out the top 10 airlines say yes, and we're going to keep pushing them uh, to do that. We're in uh, conversations with a number of them, uh, and it can't come soon enough for, for parents who have that sometimes very frustrating experience when they're flying with their kids. We will keep an eye on this story. Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg. Mr. Secretary, thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you.